I'm, I'm Justin Canfield. I'm a PhD candidate in political science here at Columbia. I'm going to be filling in as your esteemed moderator for Jay Healy, who was originally on the, in the program. Um, so let me just say that this conference could not have been better timed. Um, according to the DHS report that went out last Thursday, uh, they saw computer network attacks targeting American and European nuclear power plants, water electrical systems. Um, the White House has also alleged that Russia is behind uh, com some espionage uh, against the DNC and a social media disinformation campaign. So this suggests that the administration is getting more and more comfortable making these kinds of accusations in a public way. And it comes at a time when Russia-U.S. relations are, uh, Russia-U.S. tensions are especially high. Um, it also looks like it might get worse before it gets better. So according to the NSA and Cybercom director nominee, uh, uh, Lieutenant General Nakasone, uh, countries attacking the U.S. don't fear us. Um, so this may suggest a shift in attitude is coming. Uh, so our question is, you know, what is the way forward? Is there any way to enhance cooperation between Russia and the United States? And that's really what we're here to, to find out. So um, before I introduce the speakers, I'll just I'll, I'll reiterate the ground rules. Uh, so we'll have four speakers speaking for 15, 15 minutes each. Uh, the order will be, we'll start with uh, Oleg down at the, at the other end, and we'll just work our way down toward me again. Uh, and then uh, after they've had a chance to speak, we'll open it up for questions and answers. And just to remind everyone that this is on the record and being recorded. Uh, so our first speaker, uh, Oleg Demidov, is a consultant with PIR Center in Moscow and an active contributor to a number of expert working groups in internet governance. You'll find more information about his bio in the program. And uh, with that, please, Oleg. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, just before I start, some few remarks on uh, myself. The PR Center is a non-governmental private think tank, so I'm not representing the Russian government. And uh, the slides in my presentation are mostly devoted to the general context of US-Russia security cooperation on cyberspace and cybersecurity issues. So basically, the, su the presentation sums up what do we have and what is being ruined now by the toxic political climate and accusations on cyber attacks. So in the conclusion, I would try to identify some windows of opportunities and potential future ways to mitigate this deterioration and uh, how to switch from conflict in this area to cooperation, or at least to decrease the scale and the potential consequences of conflict uh, so just uh, reminding some basic things uh, that are necessary to know when we're talking about U.S.-Russia dialogue on cybersecurity issues. There is a deep and fundamental terminological difference between the two states and their approaches. While in the USA, cyberspace is mostly regarded as a technological domain, and the key issues with regard to network protection, cyberspace operations, and uh, ensuring cybersecurity in general are understood through the lens of technology and data, in Russia the approach is dramatically different. It was, uh, 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 there was a major update on Russian doctrinal document, the uh, doctrine of information security last year, and uh, the approach became even more enhanced and uh, updated. So it puts the key focus on the need to protect uh, social stability, political stability, and the state itself from the impact of content disseminated through uh, network means, including the internet. So the content aspect of information security has been dominating in the Russian agenda, including the legislation, including the approach to uh, information security and the analog to the Western cyber defense. Uh, this difference has major implications for the two states' negotiations and talks on cybersecurity area because the term cybersecurity could never be met in Russian official documents and uh, there was always a conflict. Uh, how do we define the subject of our negotiations and the subject of our agreements that we're going to conclude or develop? Uh, it costed at least one year uh, to the process of negotiating a set of agreements on the bilateral TCBMs on cybersecurity. It was supposed to be concluded and signed in 2012, but because of, of the debates on terminological uh, aspects of the document, it took one year later to sign it. Uh, I'll pay more attention to the set of agreements later in my presentation. 
So there is no uh, common definition, there is no any compromise uh, or any shared understanding between the two states now and uh, the Russia's attempt to promote the, uh, the content aspect of information security on the international arena within the UN format or within the other international frameworks and venues meets opposition from the US and from the Western allies, Western countries, because it is understood as a systemic approach that promotes censorship on, on the internet. Uh, just to finish uh, that idea, next slide shows the, the classic thing, which is this OOC model, the, net, the key model structuring the network communications and open interconnection systems. So cybersecurity encompasses all of those layers and goes beyond because there are content-related aspects of cybercrime, there are content-related aspects of uh, cyberspace operations in the, even in the Western practice and even in the Western doctrines. However, the Russian approach goes far beyond this scheme and far beyond the layers of network communications. It includes even spiritual values that might come under threat uh, because of dissemination of information. So it seems to be that Russia has been paying much more attention since the very beginning to the issues that are quite new now for Western debate and uh, defense paradigms such as fake news, uh, propaganda and counter-propaganda operations on the internet and so on. So uh, once again, those are different aspects and different domains of cyberspace, uh, electronic warfare, uh, psychological operations in the Western vision. Uh, to be more correct in the vision of the U.S. Department of Defense. Uh, all of those spheres are different. There are interconnections, there are overlappings, but those are domains for separate uh, kinds and types of activity and for separate structures to conduct them. In Russia, the domain of information security combines and brings together probably all of those uh, spheres, all of those niches and all of those aspects. That's why it pretends to be near comprehensive. Unfortunately, I do not have the similar picture for the Russian approach. Just imagine all of those circles and all of those spheres combined into one and operations within those spheres conducted in a uh, very tight interconnection. There is a very tight link between cyber uh, activities and uh, information uh, coverage of those activities. Uh, one final thought before we jump to the two countries cooperation and conflict is that the two states have parallel process of institutionalization of their strategic cyber capabilities and cyber defense. In Russia the first uh, summary of conceptual views of the Russian armed forces on the issues of cyber defense and cyber operations were published in January 2012 by the Russian Ministry of Defense. Since 2013 the process is going on of establishment the Russian analog to the US Cyber Command within the structure of the general staff of the armed forces of Russian Federation. And finally last year there was some um, updates on the legislation and plans to deploy the totally independent from the internet, a restricted segment for data transfer, uh, a separate telecommunication network of federal-wide, nationwide, operated and used by Russian armed forces. Uh, so starting with the bilateral track, what do we have now? We have uh, a very good mechanism which was adopted in 2013 by Presidents Putin and Obama. And currently, after the deterioration of crisis in Crimea and Eastern Ukraine, it has been frozen, unfortunately. So there were, there were three agreements on bilateral TCBMs and one additional mechanism established to develop and expand and enhance those agreements four years ago. So the first mechanism was, uh, jump into next slide, a direct communication link between high-level officials in the White House and Security Council of Russia. That was a very uh, proper and a very demanded uh, channel for crisis communication for the cases when uh, 
the technical specialist of one country spot a major cyber attack uh, coming from the territory or using the infrastructure allocated on the territory of the other nation uh, to US from Russia or vice versa within those mechanisms. So this communication link uh, is supposed and designed to be uh, an urgent tool for high level officials to communicate to each other and to double check and to clarify whether there is some governmental activity behind those signs of computer attack uh, coming from the territory of this nation. Uh, there was another communication link, uh, not for high level officials, but for technical expert, experts uh, operating the two CERTs, cyber emergency response teams of the two countries. Uh, the first uh, was uh, Russian Gov CERT operated by FSB Federal Security Service. The second one was National US CERT. So uh, this link uh, ha is based upon the upgraded and modernized infrastructure of the communication hot links of the two nuclear risk reduction centers. In some way, this is a symbolic thing because uh, this measure, this uh, transparency building measure expands and develops the philosophy of nuclear risk reduction centers that were established in the end of 80s to decrease the risk of um, unnecessary and unexpected escalation of a strategic nuclear conflict between two countries that might have been caused by human operator mistake or other, dis or other deceptive factor. Uh, so the final mechanism was direct communication and exchange of routine technical information on a regular basis between the two cyber emergency response teams. The thing which is really a routine and something uh, very natural for cyber emergency response teams all, all over the world, because most certs are private, not government owned. However, for the two national certs of Russia and the US, that was something new. Uh, despite the fact that the mechanism of these agreements was, has been active just for half a year before the outbreak of crisis in Crimea and Ukraine, it turned out to be useful even over this short period. In an interview to Russian media, the Russian special, um, uh, special uh, um, aide to the president of the, on the issues of uh, international cooperation in the field of information security, Mr. Andrei Krutskich, acknowledged that this channel, communication between certs and exchange of information related to cyber security incidents, uh, was used when there was a massive wave of network attacks on the infrastructure of the Russian Olympics in Sochi in 2014 in February. So um, the Russian uh, security bodies used the channel to ask Americans about some uh, infrastructure that was operated for the attack and used for the attack and has some connection to the US to the infrastructure located on the territory of the United States. So it was helpful. And it wasn't an accusation, but it was an example of cooperation when, folks, we need some data on uh, the attack traffic coming from the servers on your territory, please help us. Uh, the final mechanism of well, not, not, a part, not an institutional part of the agreement, but just some ad hoc mechanism with a bilateral working group under the presidential commission. Those people uh, included representatives from security bodies and technical experts they were supposed to meet on a regular basis to develop and expand the agreements but unfortunately um, the group was frozen f even before other mechanisms in these agreements so how much time how much more time do i have oh you've got uh, about four minutes so four minutes okay so uh, what's beyond that okay slide is not on this place uh, beyond bilateral level, Russia and the U.S. have been taking active role and contributing CBMs in cybersecurity area in, an, in a couple of other formats. The first one is regional OC. Uh, upon the Russian initiative and with active contribution from Russian representatives, there were two editions of uh, lists of confidence building measures designed to reduce the risk of conflicts stemming from the use of ICTs. The last one was adopted in March 2016, and it mostly focuses on the issues of protection of critical information infrastructure. 
uh, data exchange, exchange of best practices and knowledge, mutual consultations within the OEC format on the issues of preventing cyber incidents and computer attacks on CII objects. CII stands for Critical Information Infrastructure. This is mostly on the paper. No practical, uh, no active practices have been deployed so far to support those proposals and to support those lists of CBMs, at least with at least with simultaneous participation of US and Russia. However, as a design, as a plan for, for the future, the lists are good because the issues of critical information infrastructure protection has become a major priority in the US uh, back uh, during Obama uh, presidency. And now in Russia in 2017, there was a huge update on those issues because after a 10 year interregulatory fight and debate, uh, the federal law on critical infrastructure, critical information infrastructure security was uh, uh, finalized and smoothly adopted by the parliament and signed by the president. So now Russian operators of critical information infrastructures have to meet the multiple obligations, criteria and demands from uh, security regulators, from security agencies to comply with the law. And this is a major advance in the Russian legislation and approach to critical information infrastructure protection. Uh, so um, I, I wouldn't read everything which is written on the, sl on the slide. So it's mostly about sharing national approaches, best practices, terminological understanding, and of course sharing information, mostly on CII protection and uh, practices used to detect early signs of computer attacks on critical infrastructure objects to mitigate them and to prevent such incidents. Um, this is just continuing sad of uh, the mechanisms from the last second a list of CBMs. So uh, skipping that further. Um, so the global framework where Russia and the US used have been cooperating and trying to find the common language, common understanding for cybersecurity issues has been the United Nations. A group of governmental experts uh, launched, uh, established upon the Russian initiative over a decade ago and uh, active till the moment. Uh, summarizing the history and achievements of the group, there was a major breakthrough in 2015 when uh, the group, including US and Russia as one of its two major members and contributors, agreed upon a report that for the first time on the UN level proposed a set of volunteer norms for the two countries, uh, for all countries uh, to follow as uh, some way to um, as a way to to a better global go global cyber governance and the path towards prevention of major cyber wars and cyber conflicts. So this is uh, the breakthrough point in the UNGG work. Uh, so set of voluntary and non-binding norms, rules and principles of responsible behavior of states in cyberspace. So that, w that included the principle of territorial responsibility for computer attacks uh, coming from the territory of your nation, uh, restricts upon the use of allowing to use your territory for major international computer attacks, uh, some restrictions on the l objects that might be legitimate targets for cyber attacks, such as the same search, cyber emergency response teams and the infrastructure ensuring the integrity of critical uh, ICT supply chains such as uh, SCADA and industrial control systems designed for um, nuclear industry and other critical infrastructure industries and further and further. So this is a good thing, but unfortunately the last series of meetings of the UNGG turned out to be a failure last year because after successful 2015 report, the nations, including US and Russia, were not able to agree upon further extension and in-depth uh, development of those norms. 
So the fundamental problem is that we have been facing threats, mutual accusations, and the loss of trust in cyberspace in the first instance between Russia and the USA at a higher pace, uh, much quicker than the UNGG manages to produce any progress and to propose any working solutions for the situation. The speed at which this mechanism mechanisms have been developed and proposed is not enough. We need something urgent, we need something now. And uh, the current level of mutual trust and on a broader scale, the international trust in cyberspace is much lower than the one needed for those mechanisms, those volunteer norms to be adopted and uh, complied with by any significant number of the national community members. So coming up, well, I'll just skip a couple of slides. That's not so principally important. Coming up to my conclusions, we're not in the situation where we can reanimate, revitalize the bilateral agreements of 2013 right at the moment. This is, this is very negative thing. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to finish. Uh, unfortunately, we're also not in the situation where the UNGG or OSCE confidence building measures, volunteer norms, and other cyber governance tools might be able to, to work and to be effective now. So what do we have? Are there any windows of opportunities or ways to make the situation better? I would mostly leave it for the Q&A session, but my guess is that at the moment we need some network of direct military to military crisis communication lines between the militaries of the two countries just to prevent the more and more likely scenario of unexpected escalation of a major cyber conflict. So this is a measure, this is a measure of the kind we do something not to get the situation worse in the future tomorrow. But, most, but largely this is all we can do for now in the short term perspective. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Oleg. I think I think that dovetails nicely with uh, what Erica is going to talk about. Uh, so next we have Dr. Erica, Erica Borkhart. Uh, she's a uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations uh, as an International Affairs Fellow. Um, she specializes in strategic culture and escalation dynamics in cyberspace. Uh, she was previously previously an assistant professor and executive director of the Grand Strategy Program at West Point. So with that, I'll turn to Erica. Thanks, Justin. Is it? Um, thanks, Justin. Thank you, Kim, for setting up this um, this panel and this conference. I'm really excited to be participating. Um, and as the uh, the caveat goes, I don't represent the U.S. government, so anything that I say is uh, reflects my personal opinion on these on these things. Um, and so, given that the topic of this conference is conflict and cooperation in U.S.-Russia security relations, and we're here talking about cyberspace, I thought I would talk about some of or, or highlight one factor that uh, could potentially lead to conflict, even if inadvertent, and then um, pay, piggyback a little bit on what Oleg was discussing about um, potential prospects for cooperation. Um, I may be a little bit more optimistic than you are. Okay. Um, we'll see. <laughs> we'll, we'll see who's right. Um, so what I'm going to do is begin talking about um, some of the things that make signaling in cyberspace. Um, between adversaries such as the US and Russia particularly difficult, and then talk about some things that could potentially alleviate them. So developing effective mechanisms for signaling in general, not just in cyberspace, is important, um, especially between rivals, because it can help convey the intent behind observed behavior, and therefore avoid unintended conflict or escalation of crises, and because it can demonstrate help demonstrate resolve and therefore buttress deterrence. Um, Signaling is important, but it's difficult, and it's always difficult, even outside of the realm of cyberspace. And this is because, as we know, the international system is anarchic, right? So there are asymmetries of information, um, and there's the potential for misperception. And also because signals often get lost in cultural translation. Um, in cyberspace, I think there are several factors that make signaling not you know, necessarily more difficult, but sort of that are unique to this domain that, um, that are important to point out. Um, a recent example, and Justin, I'm glad that you mentioned this in your intro, because I was um, not happy to read the news about the, uh, 
the Russian incursion into U.S. critical infrastructure, but happy in that it provided a great vignette for me to sort of talk through all the ways in which signaling in cyberspace is hard. Um, so as you all know, um, last week the U.S. government publicly attributed um, a series of incursions into U.S. critical infrastructure um, to Russian government actors. And specifically, the Department of Homeland Security reported that Russians gained access to industrial control systems, SCADA systems, um, across a range of critical infrastructure sectors. So energy, nuclear, commercial, water, aviation, and critical manufacturing. Um, what's interesting about this is that I noticed when I was reading the New York Times article about this, um, about this event, the Times said, and I'm going to just read the quote, United States officials and private security firms saw the attacks as a signal by Moscow that it could disrupt the West's critical facilities in the event of a conflict. But how do we actually know that this was the intended signal? And maybe the New York Times knows more than I do. Um, but just taking this at face value, right, based on the information that we know, what, do we act, what can we actually infer about, um, about what the U.S. government has reported? Um, so first, there's a question of attribution, and I don't mean the typical attribution problem in cyberspace where technical attribution is difficult, um, and I don't even mean political attribution in terms of assigning um, political responsibility for a cyber attack or a cyber incursion, because we've kind of crossed those hurdles already. What I'm talking about is um, questions about delegation of authority and command and control for these kinds of cyber operations. Um, knowing more about that would help better discern the intent behind um, these kinds of things. Um, one of the factors that complicates assessments of attribution in a broad sense um, is that governments often work with proxy groups in cyberspace to carry out their operations. Um, proxies are appealing for lots of different reasons. One, the obvious one is plausible deniability, right? Um, so that helps complicate attribution. Um, also, proxies provide skills that um, government actors may lack. Um, proxies can be useful in particular for authoritarian governments to co-opt citizens who may otherwise engage in anti-government behavior with their skills. Um, they could also be tools for internal competitions for power and influence within members of the uh, security apparatus. Um, but there is considerable, so, so the U.S. government attributed these incursions to Russian government actors. But what does that mean, and how close are these actors to the Russian government? Um, there's a lot of variation across government proxy relations in terms of the extent to which the government is willing or able to actually exert command and control over these proxy groups. Um, so just to give you an example of very loose command and control, you may remember that in 2007, um, with, the Estonian, um, with the Estonian attacks, Russian online hacker forums were flooded with calls to action, pretty simple tools that any patriotic hacker um, or uh, concerned citizen could use um, in furtherance of um, Russian, Russian objectives, right? So this is pretty loose command and control. Um, it's likely that this more recent incursion um, was more systematically controlled and reached up to higher levels of government. And I'm just surmising this because this is a very tailored access dependent attack that would have been very sophisticated to carry out. And because of the sensitivity of the target, right, critical infrastructure is, um, um, is pretty sensitive. Um, but we still lack good information about delegation authorities that could help us better discern the intent behind this operation. So was this campaign approved at the highest levels of government and or Putin himself? Which specific Russian government actors carried this out? Um, so attributing things in a broader sense, um, not sort of the technical attribution that people often refer to when they talk about the attribution problem in cyberspace, would help. Um, second, there is the issue of the lack of indices um, or commonly agreed upon frameworks that help convey the meaning behind observed behavior, right? So again, the New York Times says this was meant as a signal, but how do we know that? Um, how do we know whether gaining access to industrial control systems is, one, operational preparation of the environment for a forthcoming cyber attack, two, Russia signaling that it has the capabilities to do so if it wanted to as part of a broader strategy of coercion or deterrence, effectively saying, hey, I'm inside your wire, don't press me. Um, if that's the case, 
it's unclear what the U.S. is supposed to do or not do in response to this. So what is, you know, even if this is signaling, what exactly is the response that the Russian government wants to elicit from the United States? We don't know that. Um, or is it industrial espionage? I mean, it's probably not, but I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> um, and so this matters because it shapes the appropriate policy response from the U.S. government. And if we get it wrong, it could trigger unwanted crisis escalation. The further wrinkle is that even if we do get it right and we interpret this meaning behind the observed behavior in the correct way, we still haven't really figured out um, what the sort of appropriate, we haven't developed fully mature thresholds for responses and policy options tailored to specific types of cyber incidents to really know what to do about these kinds of things. Um, one thing that would alleviate some of this ambiguity would be coupling cyber operations with diplomatic signaling, but uh, so far that's been pretty rarely observed. Um, it also doesn't help matters that even within the United States, we lack a common lexicon for even categorizing these types, different types of cyber operations. So I thought it was notable that in the same New York Times article I was reading, and across the US media, in fact, uh, this was almost uniformly referred to as a cyber attack. Russia cyber attack against US critical infrastructure. But it wasn't. It wasn't a cyber attack. It was an incursion, and that matters, and they're in our critical infrastructure, but it wasn't an attack. Um, and the fact that even within the US public, we don't have agreement on what words mean um, is, uh, is, is bad. <laughs> um, we also don't know, and I apologize for identifying all the things that we don't know and not really having answers, but such is the nature of um, cyberspace. Um, so another thing we don't know is whether the Russians actually intended for us to discover this, which could mean that it actually wasn't intended to be a signal at all, because if it's intended to be a signal, then you're supposed to receive it and know that it has some sort of meaning attached to it. Um, so if you read the... Um, the official DHS report, which is a lot of it's really boring and has a lot of sort of technical things in it. Um, the report also notes that the uh, Russian threat actors took very deliberate actions to cover their tracks once they were inside US networks. So they removed applications they had installed and the logs. They deleted connections made to remote systems. So this could suggest that um, the US discovery of the breach maybe just reflects poor Russian tradecraft. Or maybe this was some meta deception operation that we don't even really understand. OK, um, complicating matters even further. What do we make of the fact that during his confirmation hearing, right around the same time, General Nakasone, who was nominated for, uh, to be the incoming commander of US Cyber Command, director of the NSA, to replace Admiral Rogers, testified on the record that, of course, the United States is prepared to and is making plans to um, hold adversary critical infrastructure at risk. In other words, we do the same thing. So this raises yet another question. Could the Russian cyber infiltration be part of a larger strategic, but perhaps semi-private communication between Russia and the US that we and the public and the private sector are only kind of feeling the effects of? We're experiencing it, but there are things that are going on um, that, that we don't observe. Okay, so a lot of unknown unknowns, um, known unknowns. Um, so the question is, are we doomed because of bad signaling? We simply have to accept that there are little to no prospects for communication and cooperation between rivals like the US and Russia and cyberspace. So I think not necessarily. So Oleg, I know you talked about confidence building measures, which is something I was also gonna talk about. So I will, I will try to not repeat uh, some of the things that you already said, but I think there is some hope for confidence building measures, um, more on the bilateral side than the multilateral side. Mm -hmm. So just to give you some background on confidence building measures in general, um, these were things that arose during the early days of the Cold War. Uh, before we had arms control, um, the US and the Soviet Union confronted issues of communication, difficulty signaling, and the stakes then were really high right, uh, strategic nuclear war. Um, and yet, uh, we were able to develop confidence building measures, or CBMs, to help communicate and promote transparency and therefore reduce the risk of unintended conflict escalation. 
So broadly speaking, CBMs, um, they're voluntary measures. They're not enforced in the way arms control agreements are enforced. Um, so they're self-imposed to try to clarify intent um, and build trust with a rival. Um, the gold standard of these was the Helsinki Final Act in 1975, orchestrated by the OSCE. Um, and basically, um, one of its more notable provisions was, um, was the uh, confidence building measures um, about m reporting requirements of military exercises that would exceed over 25,000 troops, that would be within 250 kilometers of the state's border, um, exchanges of military delegations, things like this to sort of promote um, transparency. So, and as Oleg mentioned, and I don't know, how, much, how am I doing on time? We have uh, about five more minutes. Five minutes, okay. So, as Oleg mentioned, there have been um, efforts recently to sort of see if we can make CBMs work for cyberspace. Arms control is probably a bridge too far, um, not, not only for political reasons, but also um, because of the nature of uh, military capabilities or offensive capabilities in cyberspace, that the things you would um, do to verify compliance with an arms control agreement would, um, would be sort of too penetrative and, and would end up, no state would be willing to agree to this kind of thing because um, the information you would have to reveal um, would mean that uh, any capability that, you, that you're developing, even if it would be with complying with an arms control agreement would be, uh, would be rendered moot. So, um, but maybe CBMs are possible. So um, as Oleg mentioned, OSCE has spearheaded some multilateral CBMs. G7 and G20 have also um, made some efforts to try to develop norms for cyberspace. Um, the UN GGE had several rounds, 2013, 2015 were successful. Um, one of the big uh, successes was consensus that international law applies to cyberspace. Unfortunately, in 2017, and I'm not going to blame specific countries, but maybe some countries that we're talking about today kind of couldn't agree on how international law applies and then also kind of backslid on the original agreement about international law applying in the first place. Um, there are some interesting um, corollaries betwe between um, the ability to, to conceive of CBMs in a multilateral sense and regime type right because um, a lot of these multilateral CBM efforts have been about sovereignty and international law and there's a lot of disagreement between, and this is of course really broad brushstrokes, right, but between authoritarian governments who see um, who perceive the internet, um, the utility of the internet within and external to their borders very differently than how the U.S. does, right? So the U.S. position is that a free, open, secure internet is a fundamental right, um, you know, and we know this contrasts with the Great Firewall, right? So obviously they're, they're competing concepts of sovereignty. So the multilateral efforts to derive clarity on this have really ha have failed. Um, the bilateral agreements, right, so the 2013 Presidential Commission um, was initially more successful. And I think, so, so where I come down uh, on this is that I think there is, are more prospects, prospects for success at the bilateral than the multilateral level, if only because of all the coordination problems with multilateral agreements, the fact that you have these fundamental d disagreements about how sovereignty applies, how international law applies, what states, like, could and should be doing with the internet to their populations within their borders, et cetera. Um, but, the, but what's nice about bilateral agreements is that like during the Cold War, Russia and the United States can agree that nobody wants inadvertent conflict, right? Like putting aside the other sort of normative disagreements, no one wants, uh, both sides don't want a war that neither side wants, right? That's very tautological, but you get what I'm saying. Um, so, so I'm not going to rehash all the things you outlined about the um, what was agreed to in the uh, in the 2013 bilateral commission that was then um, we suspended our participation after Russia's invasion of the Ukraine in 2014, right? But um, what's interesting is that uh, something that you didn't mention it was reported in 2016 that during sort of the later days of the um, the presidential election, President Obama actually communicated to Putin using the Nuclear Risk Reduction Center to deter Russia from directly interfering with U.S. voting systems. 
Um, this is reported in the news. Um, what's interesting is that the hotline was used not for detente purposes, um, but for deterrence. Um, but either way, it's not like the thing died after Ukraine, right? Like, so, so the, the hotline has been used um, to convey the severity of a sort of, or, or to signal, really, in, in cyberspace or about cyber things. Um, so that said, um, there has been, there are lots of reasons for pessimism about CBMs. I think more so for multilateral than bilateral, but um, I think it's at least worth, <laughs> worth a shot um, to see whether, even at the most basic level, sort of the hotline, right? And we know the hotline came about in the Cold War after the Cuban Missile Crisis because we realized, oh, hey, we need a way, <laughs> we need a way to communicate. Um, and I think that um, Russia and the U.S. have come together to the consensus that, like, at least at the basic level, this kind of communication is important and worthwhile. And so any steps that could be made to sort of promote further bilateral um, communication and transparency, I think, maybe offer some prospects for, um, for optimism. So I, I think with that, uh, we'll, we, it's a good opportunity to move to Dr. Clement. So Dr. Peter Clement is a retired CIA analyst and senior research fellow at CIPA, where he teaches on Russian security policy. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I'm following a, a very difficult act here. Can everybody hear me okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Yeah. So I thought today what I would look at is perhaps a little bit more of a focus on people other than the United States and Russia. So th the more I have looked into this issue, the more I'm struck and concerned about issues related to attribution. Um, I'm not a cyber expert. I know there are some serious cyber experts in the audience, and I w I'm happy to draw on them in the Q&A and perhaps even in this talk. Um, I have had a fair amount of experience in my intelligence career in dealing with foreign liaison and getting to the heart of the business of how do you actually exchange information, decisions that have to be made beforehand before you engage in such talks. So what I would like to do today, I want to use two examples to highlight the problem of attribution. Uh, then I would like to talk a little bit about um, my personal thoughts on uh, how do you come up with what I call an action plan for dealing with a cyber event. So I get into the nitty gritty of how you might actually build a decision making process in which you make a determination on what do you think is really going on, who might be responsible, and once you've made some uh, assessments on that, how do you go about engaging whoever it is you think is behind the act or not. So with that, uh, Sarah, could you do me a favor? Um, as a child of the Cold War, I grew up in a time when the thing we worried about most was somebody was going to launch missiles and we would be victims of a nuclear attack. Uh, I recall distinctly we had canned f food and water in our basement for that horrible moment. I lived in Long Island, not far from New York City, so we were all concerned we were going to be high on the list of targeted places in the United States. So this was very real and we thought, oh my goodness, this is the thing we should be most scared about. And I will confess, even after what I heard this morning in the nuclear panel, I personally am actually more concerned about the threats we're talking about in the cyber realm. In my view, this is the new battle space. This is where the war is perhaps maybe already underway, and this is what makes it so insidious. There are the kinds of things that Erica was just talking about, about getting into people's infrastructure and industrial control systems and SCADA, to me, that's kind of the equivalent of that nuclear attack because I'm not entirely thinking we're really going to have a nuclear attack anytime soon. I, I'm hopefully I'm correct in that assessment. The cy cyber thing to me is way more real and I suspect we've all experienced cases where the ATM machine didn't work for a couple of hours and we all go crazy. What do you mean we can't get our money? So with that, could we do the first clip? Thank you, Sarah. Repeat, Hawaii to Jupiter 16. There is an unidentified object on our scope closing fast. I see nothing. Can you give me a bearing? It appears to be coming up fast from astern. Hey, now I see it. It's another space plant. I repeat, it's another space plant. Chris, this is fine. Does it look like a closed pass? You are breaking up. Say again. Repeat, does it look like a closed pass? Hey, Chris, what's happening? Right? It's coming right at us. The front is opening up. I repeat, the front is opening up. It's coming right at us. Chris, get back in. Get back in. Chris, it's taking the state on the arena. You're biking out. Repeat, you're biking out. Hey, what's happening? Chris, what's happening? Hey, Jupiter 16. Hey, Jupiter 16. Are you receiving? Come in, please. Over. Jupiter 16 is the state on the arena. 
Are you receiving me? Come in, please. Over. Hello, Houston. Hawaii. We've lost all radio contact. We've also lost him on the scope. Unidentified object is still orbiting. We'll alert all stations and track him closely. It is ridiculous for the Soviet government to deny responsibility in this matter. The Soviet government denies all knowledge of this affair. The world knows we are a peace-loving people. I hereby give notice that in 20 days' time, the United States intends to launch her next spaceship into orbit. My government has instructed me to inform you that any interference with this spaceship will be regarded as an act of war. May I ask what motive? Our Russian friends would have for wishing to destroy American spacecraft? My government sees this as nothing less than a blatant attempt to gain complete and absolute control of space itself. That's fictional, of course. Uh, for those of oh, you... <laughs> <laughs> so I had to have a little fun with this, but to be honest, I mean, I've actually thought about these kind of Cold War era parallels. This is a classic case where there's obviously somebody who did this and we all know who did it. But in fact, if you watch the whole movie, it was really somebody else. It was a non-state actor. One of the things I love about Ian Fleming is he was way ahead of the curve. All these movies have some strange guy living on a little island with a little army of people who do these things, and everybody thinks it's the other superpower, but it's usually not. Uh, it's probably more instructive to talk about a real-life recent example, um, which in the course of my research, I knew when this happened, but I didn't know very much about it. And the more I read, the more horrified I was about an actual cyber attack. Uh, and this involves a company called Mirai. And Jason, am I pronouncing that correctly? No, that was the malware. That was the hacker. Yes, M-I-R-A-I. -I. Mm -hmm. It's Mirai. So um, the, the reason I like this one is it tracks with this little movie clip very, very well. Essentially, this Mirai botnet or attack um, affected literally four or five different continents. It took down the internet in the country of Liberia for a fair amount of time. There were a major outage on an entire Friday afternoon on the east coast of the United States. And the cyber geek experts were very worried about, holy cow, this thing is so big and it's so uh, proliferating at such a high velocity that it could actually um, undermine the infrastructure, underlying infrastructure of the internet itself. And it affected a lot of private sector companies. And the FBI got on this, and the more people talked about it, and they talked to experts, one expert was quoted in the media saying, well, there's, there's only two people this could probably be. It's either China or Russia. Okay, as you can see where I'm going here, it was neither China nor Russia. And at the end of the day, what they found out, it was really a college student in a college in northern New Jersey, and two of his buddies uh, who perpetrated this attack. But this thing went on for like six months, between September 2017 and February, I'm sorry, 2016 to February 2017. And one of the reasons I think it got the FBI's attention is people were worried, is this somehow related to the U.S. election, which was coming up, obviously, in November. So at the end of the day, it turns out it was these three college-age students, and what was their motive? So these people were engaged in a wonderful game called Warcraft. It is Warcraft. Minecraft. I knew I was going to get this. <laughs> you can tell I've never played this game, and I'm not a gamer. But I did discover about 123 million people in the world play this game. And the three people who were the culprits here, their initial motivation was to best their adversaries in this wonderful game because some of the adversaries were utilizing things that would protect them against denied distribution of service attacks. So these guys, being geeky enough to figure out how to overcome that advantage, then decided, gee, there's potential money to be made here because we could provide services to people who want to overcome these attacks, and since we know who the attacks are coming from, we can be both generating the supply and the demand and make a lot of money in the process. So the FBI finally figured out who it was. My, my point here is there are so many people. There is an infinite range of potential third-party actors, like in the movie, and actually far more now, because that actually required a little bit of wherewithal to launch something and get it in space. Mr. Musk, I think, wasn't out and about just yet to do that. But in the cyber world, it could be anybody. It could be that 300-pound person living in the basement in New Jersey. I don't know. But 
um, it just brought home to me the fact that um, you really need to think well in advance, and this is where I actually started having a lot more fun because it relates more to what I've been doing for a good part of my life, is you need to be prepared and have an action plan. In a particular case, like a cyber event, and I want to use the word event here, um, I don't want to get into social media manipulation, which is, in my view, separate than a cyber attack where you're actually getting into something to uh, destroy it or uh, cripple it. Social media is a whole different category that we can maybe do that in Q&A if you want to go there. But if you actually have an attack and you're a government entity and it affects your public or your government or your military, what's the plan you have in mind? So in terms of the planning piece for decision making, I, you should, in my view, have in place, um, and Professor Jervis I think would like this, you need to have a set of criteria in mind what are the specific things that qualify as an intrusion or an attack? Are there different gradations and levels? What are your various thresholds for uh, defining them at such a particular level? Once you've done that, come up with specific examples of what would such a thing look like? What is the thing we're talking about in terms of uh, responding to? Um, and then uh, what are the kinds of options that you can generate in response to that? And this, I think, is perhaps as difficult a part of this uh, process. For example, uh, do you war game this? Uh, and ideally, in my view, if you do the war game scenario and you have a blue team, red team exercise and you game it out, um, that hopefully should identify along the way the many ways in which this could go wrong. And then depending on which path you're going, if you take a tree and go on its various branches, what are the various responses you might contemplate for each one of these different paths. And you ought to have this sort of laid out in a script somewhere, <coughs> then when some horrible thing happens, uh, and that's the other thing, like this gets to the issue of criteria and threshold. What if somebody takes out power in a small town in Iowa for half a day? It, okay, where do you put that on your threshold scale? On the other hand, if uh, there's no TMs working in New York City for a week, presumably that's a little higher on your scale. You should come up with a whole variety of different scenarios uh, to determine which ones, in your view, reach a threshold at which point you feel you must take some kind of an action. Of course, that also assumes you know who was. And this gets to the attribution piece. Hopefully, you have a dedicated team of people who focus on the hard forensic work of trying to come up and narrowing the uh, pool of applicants, uh, culprits, for the particular attack. Once you've determined that, then you get into the place where we get, I think, what Oleg and Erica were talking about. Okay, who do we have a dialogue with? Uh, what's the best place to start with this dialogue? Is it at the bilateral level? Um, I actually agree. I like the idea of bilateral because it's, depending on the issue at hand, speed might be of the essence. And uh, working bilaterally, particularly if you think strongly it's one. But then again, you get into diplomacy. How are you going to approach your counterpart? Uh, this is an issue we spent a lot of time f uh, fussing about in the U.S. government. How am I doing for time? Uh, you know, I'm finish close. your finish your thought, but okay. So the thought here: um, Who's the appropriate interlocutor? At what level do you want to raise it, and how do you present it? Do you go in pounding your fist like the guy in the movie, saying, "We know you did it. You sneaky guys, uh, don't ever do it again, or we're going to take you out." Is that the right approach, or is there perhaps a more diplomatic approach to try to engage and say, "Look"? We've had this problem. Have you had a problem like this? I mean, there are ways you get into a conversation, hopefully, that will lead to potentially an exchange. Then you get it, if you get far enough along in that, then you can start talking about exchange of information. And I'm going to stop there. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Clement. So, uh, last but not least, we're going to have uh, Kier Giles. So, Kier is a senior consulting fellow at Chatham House and an expert on the Russian approach to cyber and uh, information warfare more broadly. Thanks, Justin. Good afternoon. I'm going to broaden the topic out a little to come in line with the, uh, the title of the panel about intelligence and cyber cooperation. Unfortunately, even if we take both of those topics together, it's still challenging to find ways of cooperating with somebody with whom you have fundamentally incompatible strategic objectives. And that's the case with the United States and Russia, because one of the elements that was missing from this morning's panel discussion, where nuclear is one of the areas where there is a certain commonality of interest between Russia and the US, is that for Russia, the West, led by the United States, is the adversary. All the more so since 2014, when 
appetite for cooperation has been constrained still further by the notion that conflict is underway in all domains except open military combat. And that is the context within which we have to see these uh, incursions into critical national infrastructure, attempts to influence political systems domestically. Previously, it might have been possible that on a strictly tactical level and under limited circumstances, there were instances where Russian intelligence and security cooperation could be of use to the United States, including cyber-enabled. Instances come to mind like, for example, the Boston bombing attack or the exception that proves the rule, the Sochi Olympics, an exception in several different ways. For example, U.S. interests at stake directly on Russian territory, therefore direct Russian input that can be of use in securing them, but also demonstrating the strict limitations and the one-way flow that is inevitably imposed whenever there is any successful cooperation arrangement between the two intelligence services of the two countries. Coming up to date, if you look at now the security challenges on which Russia and the US could conceivably cooperate, whether it is Syria or what's happening in Afghanistan or cyber or intelligence or information warfare, any global security challenges, the fact is that in all of these, Russia is working directly against US interests, which you might assume would preclude any meaningful cooperation. There's an analogy here with the, uh, the situation in conventional arms control where Russia is simply not showing willing to observe existing agreements. We heard this morning about the, uh, the ins and outs of the INF treaty violations, but also consider other documents that are in theory still in force. Whether it's uh, Open Skies Treaty, where there's a huge asymmetry of implementation, where Russia is flying very capable intelligence gathering platforms over the United States, inspecting not only military installations, but also, again, critical national infrastructure, and we have to assume that they are probing for vulnerabilities in the same way as the cyber incursions were. Compare that with the Russian approach to incoming inspection missions under Open Skies, which are routinely obstructed. Similarly, transparency under the Vienna document. Uh, during the recent Zapad exercise, it was just brought to public attention that Russia has routinely flouted its obligations under this in order not to report exercises and not to allow observers in. All of these provide a situation where there are no indications that cooperation is in good faith is likely with Russia under current circumstances. And there are complicating factors as well. First of all, the cult cultivation of ambiguity that Erica referred to, so that you do not know who the right person is to talk to about any given action that appears to come from Russia in the way that, uh, that Peter was calling from just now. Over and above that, there are not only directly conflicting strategic objectives, but also conflicting concepts of cooperation itself. You might think that there are areas of the world where interests do align, so Russia and the United States could do something together, particularly in those parts where Russia has strong links and capabilities, for instance, it's in its own backyard. Unfortunately, it's not like, for example, working with France to catch bad guys in North Africa, where you would cooperate with shared capabilities and without the assumption that the United States is working to undermine France itself. But for Russia, that assumption is ever present and it guides Russian behaviors. So proposals for cooperation that come from Moscow take the form of installing mechanisms to control US power and action by input into decision making processes up to and including vetoes on action altogether. Or alternatively, ways to string out situations where the United States is unhappy with what is going on in order that Russia can continue its own processes unconstrained. For example, the multiple instances of negotiations over ceasefires that have been drafted in Moscow, the Minsk peace process governing what is happening in Ukraine, the iterations of talks between Russia and the United States in Geneva about what is happening in Syria, all of them provide the semblance of cooperation in order that Russia can continue doing what it wanted to anyway while constraining the US. Let's have a quick tour of all of the, the candidates for cooperation that are actually available at the moment. Intelligence cooperation on counterterrorism comes up as a recurring candidate where it would seem that there are good prospects for working together. However, counterterrorism cooperation overall falls down usually when people realize that neither the end which is desired by Russia nor the means which Russia uses to get there 
is acceptable to the United States as a Western liberal democracy which subscribes to Western liberal values. Let's recall that Russia sees the pacification of Chechnya as a successful counter-terrorist operation and therefore applies the same principles in Syria. Civilian casualty is not something to be avoided, but something to be exploited as a tool for leverage in order to erode the will to resist of the adversary and the will of the population to support them. You will hear that there was a success successful program of counterterrorism cooperation between NATO and Russia before relations were suspended, but it's instructive to look in detail at what that really meant and what lay behind that. In practice, it was a program of meetings at shape with the Russian delegation which were rendered meaningless by recognition by both sides that there's no scope for common agreement on what terrorism, still less counterterrorism, means. Still, it was presented as a success because of the large number of people in NATO headquarters whose performance reviews depended on declaring successful partnership with Russia, since this was the overall political stance of the alliance. This is a trap not to fall into on a bilateral basis. You heard Eliak earlier calling for agreement on cyber. He said, we need something now, we need something urgently. This is the language that is used by Putin's cyber tsar that he referred to, Andrei Krutskich. He also talks about the danger of the proliferation of actors that Peter referred to just a moment ago. His favorite metaphor is of an asteroid which is hurtling towards the Earth. The asteroid is mass cyber conflict and we must act now to avoid it. However, if you think through all of the different mechanisms of attempting to do so that Aliag listed, you'll see a common theme. There is agreement on principle, on principles that have long been put forward by Russia, but then it, when it comes to actually enacting them, the whole process stalls. And that is whether it was with reference to the OSCE CBMs, which, as Aliak said, was a Russian initiative, or the UNGGE negotiations, uh, Erika was not willing to say that the Russia was the problem again, but I think in the very first panel this morning, right at the beginning, Matthew put it very well. I mean, he said, let's not point any fingers, but it's Russia. <laughs> All of these, you might think, would be changed by the growing recognition of what Russia has been saying all along, as very eloquently put by Aliak, that the problem is not just hostile code, but hostile content is now much more widely recognized, especially as it has been forcefully demonstrated by Russia in this unconstrained environment by the exploitation of, for example, social media and information warfare in the broad context to attack democratic processes in this country in 2016, in other countries both before and afterwards. Now, Peter, you might say that social media is a whole other category to, uh, to cyber attacks, but as Aliag said right away, if you're looking at it from Russia, that is not the case at all. So is there therefore scope for some kind of agreement to constrain hostile actions in cyberspace based on this now common recognition of the challenges being much more broad than simply technical? We'd like to think so, and I think everybody on this panel would like to see increased and expanded CBMs. However, my assessment is that no, because the principles of freedom of expression are too firmly embedded in Western democracies to be challenged by agreement with Russia China, and other like-minded nations on how to control the spread of opinions in internet space. Here you have the First Amendment. In Europe, there is East Stratcom, the only part of the European Union which is dedicated to countering Russian information threats, which is now under threat itself because a group of MPs, members of parliament for the Netherlands, are putting forward an initiative to close it down for flagging disinformation that has come out in Dutch media. The analogy is responding to a terrorist attack by disbanding the police counterterrorism unit. But what that does indicate is that in that environment, I think there is no scope for agreement along Russian principles. In any case, in cyberspace, Russia will do what it does anyway. As we've already heard from Eric, you can't cooperate on anything operational because that requires sharing of extremely sensitive information on capabilities. Russia points out quite reasonably that there are at the moment no mechanisms to enforce or constrain actors in cyberspace, and nor can there be when there is this absence of any verification mechanism. So let's look at the good news instead. Where are there exceptions to this principle? Where are there areas where it might be productive for the United States and Russia to cooperate in terms of intelligence sharing? 
excuse me, counter-narcotics work does not advance the relationship between the US and Russia, does not make it better, it doesn't mitigate other problems, but there is scope for meeting what is undeniably a shared challenge on a tactical level. There's also cooperation as flattery, because another aim for Russia seeking to work bilaterally with the United States is to address Russian national status anxiety by pretending that Russia is an equal partner with the US, as not only Soviet nostalgists but also younger Russian nationalists aspire to be. Humoring that aspiration and pandering to Russia in this way may be based on a fiction, but it is a low-cost means of soothing national and personal neuralgias and thereby reducing friction with Russia and opportunity costs. The downside, of course, is that it punts the problem further down the track. Russia will still complain if it has no veto on approaches to global problems, even if it is consulted about them as it demands at the moment. But it does have scope for limiting, damaging actions that result from Russia feeling it is being ignored. Listen to one of the themes from President Putin's uh, address in uh, earlier this month. You haven't been listening to us, therefore we can break stuff. Here are our nuclear weapons to get your attention. Now will you listen? A tactic adopted by President Putin this month and by toddlers across, across the globe forever. The conclusion is the basic under ch underlying challenge is that if you do seek cooperation in intelligence and especially in cyberspace, the important thing is to define the aims just rather than just thinking as many do as we detect from the outside, that cooperation is a good thing in itself. Intelligence cooperation with Russia is not impossible and in some cases is desirable, but careful goal setting is absolutely critical, thinking about the desired end state beyond immediate tactical aims. And remembering that there is an asymmetry of expectation but also an asymmetry of interest. In practical terms, this kind of cooperation is likely to be far more valuable to Russia than it is to the United States. So ask the question, what can Russia give the United States that is worth the United States cooperating with the inevitable concessions that would be entailed and that the US needs badly enough to actually undergo that? At the beginning of this month, I was in a, a conference room in a s very small Western European state with the, uh, the heads of Russia policy from the Ministry of Defense, the MFA, um, delegations to international organizations. This happened before the latest Russian attack in the UK, and each of them reported how relations with Russia were moribund due to continuing Russian hostility across domains, but they all said, one by one, it was important that they succeeded in maintaining dialogue with Russia. At which point I asked, why? And that was exactly the same awkward silence. The message as far as I'm concerned, if, if you are not able or willing to articulate the reasons for talking to Russia, and if it is just based on a fundamental assumption that you have to have a conversation, my suggestion is what is far more important is what is actually said. So to wrap up, it's meaningless without an actual aim and end state. And remember, there is no scope for cooperation with Russia in a field that does not actually further the interests of the Russian state or of its leadership elite. There is a complete asymmetry of definitions. The United States wants to cooperate for reaching a shared aim and a common benefit. Russia places under the heading of cooperation ways of using opportunities to erode or control US power. It's simply the case that altruism and cooperation for the common good as opposed to for a specific state or leadership benefit is not and never has been part of the Russian political vocabulary. Uh, thanks so much, Kerry. So uh, next we're going to move to question and answer. We're running a little bit behind, which is my own fault. Uh, but if you have a question, please line up behind the microphone. It looks like we have some already. So um, I'll forfeit my, uh, my privilege as the moderator to ask the first question, and I'll turn it directly over to the audience. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Oh, and if, if you would, uh, please introduce yourself and direct a question like to a specific panelist. OK, well, um, I think I'd, uh, my name is Daniel Burke. I work at the Schiller Institute of Helga Zepp LaRouche. I'd like to direct my question to Mr. Clement. I appreciated your comments. If you forgive me for reading this briefly. 
uh, the, just my, that, written, my question uh, written down. Just please make sure that the, what you're reading is, is brief because we are the, behind time. The view from Chatham House is rather hard to take seriously when Boris Johnson just compared Russia to Nazi Germany. Um, I want to return to the question of attribution. The, most people here are aware of William Binney, who is the NSA whistleblower who uh, resigned because of unconstitutional spying on American citizens. He has met with Pompeo and said that the Russian, uh, uh, so-called alleged Russian hacking of the DNC is, uh, was not provably not Russian, but actually a thumb drive. And this has been used to increase tension to the point that people are seriously concerned about conflict with Russia. So I want to ask you, shouldn't we be looking at our own FBI, NSA corruption presently at this moment before we, st as we consider the question of attribution? You're looking at me, but you said Peter. I, 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 well, I'd be interested to hear from you as well if, if I could have a chance. First because of the chat. But Mr. Clement was the one who spoke about the idea that attribution is actually a major question and it is not so certain. Okay. Um, as was noted in the introductions, I'm a retired officer. I actually have some uh, direct knowledge of the uh, work that went into the report that was issued on January 3rd at the unclassified level. I have no doubt in my mind about attribution on this particular issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And this is for uh, Oleg and Kier, I think, predominantly. Um, I'm sorry, the Jason, <laughs> uh, Jason Haley from Columbia SIPA. Um, right now, one, one of the big ideas that's, that's uh, affecting us in international relations and cyberspace operations is the recognition of constant contact, that you've got Russian, Chinese, Iranian, all U.S., all the cyber operators in this constant contact, this persistent engagement of grappling with each other as we fight over infrastructure and access. And so I'm curious in cooperation, in what are the fire breaks, what are the off-ramps, what are the mechanisms by which these operational forces, we might be able to find a way, because um, I'm worried about miscalculation, I'm worried, uh, I'm worried about tit for tat, I'm worried about um, all sorts of areas. And so I'm kind of backing away from the strategic thinking about, about these areas. And, and, and now that we've got these operational forces that are, that are banging together in a way that we haven't really done in any other areas other than maybe espionage. So especially fire breaks and off ramps, thank you. <coughs> Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I'm afraid I won't be able to provide any comprehensive answer because no such uh, mechanisms, so fire breaks, such fire breaks are in place. And I do not see them as possible and feasible right now. This is something to be created from scratch if we speak particularly about US-Russian interactions in cyberspace. Because now we do not have anything other than uh, permanent units of government-owned certs that could conduct any cooperation and be in touch with each other. However, if, if we speak about military cyber operations and military activities in cyberspace, that's something I mentioned in the very end of my presentation that we might try to uh, promote the idea of a direct military to, to military hotlink in cyberspace uh, to inform each other on critical incidents related to attacks on strategic infrastructure. So before we create any operational structures that would be able to be in touch, be in contact uh, during cyberspace activities, we may need to conduct some in-depth and very <coughs> concrete dialogue on thresholds, issue mentioned by Dr. Clement. So uh, I mean in particular thresholds that both countries understand, uh, that both countries have for the notion of the use of force and of the notion and for the notion of armed attack in cyberspace. Because uh, we both, I mean both US and Russia are moving the strategic thinking and military decision making is moving to towards the idea of a possible kinetic response to a cyber impact, to a hostile cyber impact, if a certain threshold uh, was passed, was exceeded. But there are no clear vision of those thresholds themselves. It might be a huge problem in the context of un unexpected escalation. 
because n neither of the sides has clear understanding of the other side's thresholds and intentions and possible algor algorithms of decision making in this situation. So we may need a dialogue on particular calibration of thresholds with regard to armed attack, use of force, and aggression in cyberspace that overlaps with what other speakers were talking about. What do we define as cyber attack? There is no clarity on that either. Alec is absolutely right. There is no common understanding of thresholds. The push for a, an agreed definition of what constitutes armed attack in cyberspace plus all of the related um, legal definitions that go with that uh, um, under not just Article NATO, uh, NATO Article 5 but, uh, but UN Charter as well is something that Russia has consistently aimed for over the years and it's another element that's been consistently resisted um, by other states that are pushing back against the idea of having an additional layer of legislation which governs cyberspace over and above international law, which, as you heard, the UNGGE uh, agreed applied to actions in cyberspace a couple of years ago. To me, the missing element is not so much that definition which uh, would inevitably invite action which comes to just below the agreed threshold in order to trigger a response. To me, the missing element is any form of deterrence because the, the challenge of miscalculation is intimately entwined with the fact that there are no deterrent measures currently set. So where does it become clear to the, the aggressor that there are costs and consequences for a given cyber action? How much of that actually becomes publicly known? How much of that is accompanied by the signaling that is absolutely essential to make it clear that this is a direct and considered proportional response to a given action? All of that at the moment, if it is happening, is happening at a layer which is invisible to us. And we have to assume is also invisible to several of the cyber actors that are involved in these processes. That in itself is a dangerous situation. And it will continue to be so until the principles of deterrence evolve in cyberspace in the same ways that they have in other domains. Next question, please. Yes, uh, thank you all so much for a really great panel on a really important issue. Um, my name is Eugene Sherbakov. I'm from the Carnegie Corporation. Um, and I have a question about um, the broad concept of Russian uh, information stability uh, as opposed to the more narrow definition in the US of cybersecurity, which seems to be really one of the, the major kind of sticking points in, in moving forward. Um, and so it seems that that here you, you very nicely articulated that the U.S. Uh, and, and Western uh, countries must resist the Russian concept because if you were to use it, it would mean imposing limitations on free speech and could and would most likely be used uh, to crack down on internal dissent. I wonder, some European countries have a bit of a different approach to issues of free speech and might they have a correspondingly different approach to uh, information stability in this context? And from the U.S. side, it seems that information control is actually becoming maybe more relevant after the election with all of the response to fake news, uh, you know, social polarization, et cetera, et cetera, largely due uh, in many cases to actual Russian activity. What effect will that discussion have uh, moving forward for the, for the U.S.? Thanks. So I assume it goes to me. No. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, I do not really anticipate that the ongoing and developing, evolving debate on fake news and the necessity to counter the phenomenon of propaganda on the internet would uh, change things dramatically in the context of Russia-Western uh, dialogue on information security concept. Because uh, once again, the concept of Russian information security, it's not information stability, it's information security. It is comprehensive and uh, Russia ha Russian MFA has been trying to oppose any attempts to identify and discuss separately any particular blocks within this context. So like uh, we're not gonna speak in uh, we're not gonna speak separately about the need to uh, provide cybersecurity for our systems. Instead, we should uh, speak about the need for some 
cyber governance with regard to the whole information security domain. Once again, even, even the broad agenda of fake news, uh, propaganda and counter propaganda, l l let's call it it's something analogous to PSYOPs on the internet. Uh, there might be some specific agreements or a specific dialogue on that issue, but it wouldn't change fundamentally the difference, the gap, the ideological gap between Russian and Western understandings of information security versus cybersecurity. I, I, I wouldn't expect that. On the other part of the question, yes, you're absolutely right. There is a range of opinions on this among different European nations. And like so many other things, it follows a, a very perceptible gradient. The closer you get to Russia, the higher the threat perception and the more willing people are to consider measures which in the far west of Europe are not at all under consideration. However, that's all in one bucket and what is con contemplated under Russian information security doctrine is an entirely different matter not only because of the measures that are taken to protect Russia from the free flow of information, including opinions, but also because of the perceived vulnerabilities that Russia seeks to address. If you look at the two versions of the information security doctrine that Alyag was referring to, um, 2000, which is basically prehistoric in these terms, it didn't even, even mention the internet, and 2016, the 2016 version is one third the length of the 2001 because the missing two thirds is a long list of vulnerabilities to foreign information influence which we simply would not recognize, but which were considered crucial to safeguarding Russian information security. Alek referred to, for example, to one of them, the, the safeguarding of spiritual values, which just does not feature in most Western discussions of freedom of expression because you're supposed to be able to challenge these things. So yes, there is that, uh, <coughs> that range of categories of responses, uh, but e there is no comparison with, um, with what is being implemented by Russia or, for example, China or other like-minded nations that see a threat from freedom of expression and from opinion. Uh, it looks like we have one more question, please. Hi, I'm Sydney Jones. My question is actually for Erica. <laughs> I haven't had any questions yet. I figured I'd ask. In regards to the signaling issues you were talking about with the uh, announcement of leaving Russia's behind the energy attacks, could you also see that as the U.S. kind of warning our own critical infrastructure sectors, hey, you kind of need to fix your issues? We've been telling you you need to like pony up some money, fix these issues, upgrade your systems. Even after Saudi Aramco and the attacks on Ukraine, nothing has really changed within the U.S. Thanks for the question. So I'm not sure nothing has really changed. So we do have mechanisms for sharing vulnerability and threat information with critical infrastructure. Um, and there actually are a lot of initiatives um, that are being spearheaded um, under DHS to um, better facilitate collaboration with the private sector, um, privately owned. Um, the, the, the fact that a lot of our critical, most of our critical infrastructure is privately owned and operated poses a conundrum for how we think about defending this infrastructure in cyberspace against foreign threat actors. Um, but I th actually think that's something, that's an area where everyone has kind of recognized that this is something that's important. And, um, you know, there have, there have been steps that have been taken, um, like in the financial sector in particular, to try to sort of institution, better institutionalize information sharing and even go beyond information sharing to sort of collaborate with the government to figure out and clarify what are the um, roles and responsibilities of public and versus private actors, um, both like in times of you know peace and also in the event there is um, there is a systemic attack on on critical infrastructure. So um, there are there are mechanisms that exist for information sharing. I, I think the information sharing issue is sort of less salient than sort of um, going beyond. So I, I think not that we've solved information sharing, but we've sort of figured that piece out, but there are next steps that could be taken um, to, to facilitate that even more. Sir Martin, did you have a question as well? Yes, um, I'm Kimberly Martin. I'm a professor of political science at Barnard College. Um, and my question is for Keir. 
I thought I heard you say that we don't even know sometimes who to speak to on the Russian side because we don't know who's responsible for things. And that was sort of surprising to me because I thought we had a pretty good sense of the bureaucracies that were involved on the Russian side on various things related to uh, questions of information uh, uh, issues and, and cyber issues. Uh, we have a pretty good sense of which intelligence agencies are doing which things. And so I'm wondering if you could clarify that point about not knowing who to speak to on the Russian side. Yeah, certainly. When it comes to a state actor and there is clear attribution or some kind of avowed activity, that's fairly straightforward. Not completely straightforward, because one of the things that uh, was striking to me at Aliak's presentation was the reference to a cyber command being set up in 2012, which is not at all how we understood the situation, because although it was announced in 2012 and 2013, 2014, the process, 2015, the process began. Has it ended yet? No. Nope. Right. So we, we can't talk to a cyber command. We can't talk to a cyber command because it doesn't exist. We can talk about certain degree of its functionality. For example, uh, there is a there is a an entity with a certain degree of functionality which might be responsible for part of what is going on, whose duties might overlap, for example, with the information operations troops that have been finally announced as part of the Russian order of battle after again a multi-year process. However. All of this depends on information which is generally not available in open sources. And so if you know precisely who to talk to about any given cyber antisocial activity by Russia, you are far better informed than I. Uh, so with the, with the last couple of minutes that we have, I had a question for the group. Um, and uh, obviously, we don't have a lot of time to, to go over it. But maybe if, we, if we're allowed to bleed over five minutes into the coffee break, uh, that be all right. So, so, um, <coughs> uh, so um, as several panelists mentioned already, we had several we had we had progress in confi confidence building measures during the Medvedev era, era. Since then, it's been hard to make much progress. And uh, now that the U.S. has a, a president with a very strong personality, uh, basically we have a, a we have a bilateral relationship that's very personalistic, in, in my opinion. So I'm wondering. How do you think this impacts the prospects for cooperation, given that relations are more personalistic and less institutionalized than they used to be? So uh, whoever wants to take that first, uh, I think the first two talks were dealt a lot with confidence building measures, so. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's eager to answer this <laughs> on our side. If I must. I, I, I mean. I think that um, it seems that the relationship is more sort of personal personality driven, but I think institutions s matter a lot when it comes. I mean, w when it comes to things like CBM development, right? Like, and this is this is not like a, a deep state comment, okay? But you know, y you need the like organs of government. Um, to uh, and sort of the, the institutions that actually make up what our government is, not a you know individual president, um, to sort of come to the table and hammer these things out. So I I'm not um, I don't I don't that's not an answer. I, I don't really know. You can you can take that. I uh, <laughs> I'm at a loss for well, words. Well, let me let me clarify this. So do you think it's more it's it, do you think cooperation is more likely between Trump and Putin than between somebody who is is it has less of a strong personality, uh, maybe, maybe say hypothetically if Clinton were elected. I think cooperation uh, between yeah, Trump and Putin is, is yes, indeed far more likely, but that's not the same as Erica was suggesting, I think, as cooperation between the US government apparatus and its, its Russian counterparts. Because if you follow the, the pattern of um, elation followed by deep disappointment that was shown by Russia on the, the election of Trump and his First of all, apparent willingness to enact so many long-standing Russian policy objectives for the United States, but then apparent powerless, powerlessness in getting many of them through. I think you'd see the same pattern if you were considering this kind of, uh, of bilateral discussion. Because, yes, Russia would consider, as it always does, despite repeated evidence to the contrary, that politics in other countries are as personalized as they are in Russia. Therefore, if the Tsar or the President orders it, then it will be made so, give or take one or two bureaucratic uh, obstacles. 
And so they are consistently disappointed when, uh, whether it is the deep state or a perfectly functional administration with checks and balances, actually makes sure that, no, it doesn't quite work like that. So uh, on a personal level, yes, I am sure that uh, some kind of agreement would be, would be possible to be thrashed out on a fairly uh, specious basis, but actually implementing it would be something very different. I'll add one quick footnote to this. I, um, it's a matter of public knowledge that the, the director of CIA, current director, Mr. Pompeo, has in fact met with the Russians in Moscow. They in turn came here. There was some criticism about a recent visit, I think maybe two months, three months ago, where senior Russian intelligence officials came here and we were conducting bilateral liaison kinds of activities. The things we would normally do on a range of issues, uh, some of the topics that uh, here mentioned. Um, and below that level, there are other kinds of contexts. And here I would also highlight the importance of the multiple liaison relationships that many intelligence agencies have frequently to discuss a common concern or threat or a common proposal to try to fix a problem. So I, I don't want to call it the deep state. I just don't like that. There are a lot of <laughs> career professional people who are dedicated to the mission who think they are advancing a particular interest of the, of the country uh, without necessarily going against uh, senior leadership. Uh, okay, uh, just don't feel pressured to answer. Okay, yeah, I, I'll just add a few more words to what has been said already. Uh, there's difficult to speculate on this topic, but it, it seems to me that indeed there is a bit of exaggera ex exaggeration of the personal factor uh, for with regard to both sides of the dialogue, including the Russian side. Because of course the decision-making chain in Russia is very much linked to the top layer and to Putin and President's administration, but the whole domain and the whole agenda of uh, cyber security, developing strategic cyber capabilities, it's not the favorite topic for president himself. There is a circle of people he's relying upon their opinions, their proposals, their suggested uh, visions and paradigms, paradigms for this domain. So he might not be personally interested in making some moves, unexpected moves, beyond the institutionalized, institutionalized framework of the work on critical infrastructure protection, developing strategic cyber capabilities and cyber defense that has been already going on in Russia. On the other side, we have Trump, who, to my p in, in my personal view, has come with a very ambitious program for critical information infrastructure and enhancing cyber security in the United States. But so far, as far as I could judge it, uh, the implementation of this program remains largely an imitation because 95% of what has been done is just exploitation of the basis and the institutionalized mechanism set during the Obama time. There is nothing dramatically new so far. And it seems to me that personally for Trump, cyberspace and cybersecurity is not a fav fav favorite topic as well. He's much more interested in things like, counts, uh, like uh, <laughs> fake news countering propaganda and psyops, and that might be closer to his personal field of interest. So I, I would guess that for the nearest future, the development of the dialogue, uh, would it be conflict or conflict slash cooperation dialogue in this area, would largely depend on the institutionalized process in the bureaucracies and uh, decision makers in the military and in intelligence services of the two countries, but not personally the two presidents. And that's our way of ending on a slightly optimistic note. Uh, so t as typical with cyber conversations, we may have ended up with more questions than answers, but it, I think that the discussion was very productive and insightful. And uh, now what we'll do is we'll uh, very, very briefly uh, till 3.30 break for a coffee, but please join me in uh, thanking the panelists and Professor Martin and the other coordinators for organizing. <laughs>